Okay, thanks, Oksana. So I will start. Well, thank you all, all for tuning into this talk. I'm quite happy to present about the some basic physics analysis implemented using Apache Spark. Mm -hmm. So I'm Luca Canali, and I'm in the CERN IT Spark and Analytics Services, and also with, uh, with the Atlas Data Engineering and uh, DBA team. Okay, we'll move to the next slide. All right, sharing doesn't move. So okay, let me reshare. All right. Okay, so a bit of motivations about this work. So the contest is the Spark service at CERN. And then I was getting questions from the um, I think Spark community saying, why, why doesn't have a use uh, Spark or what are the blockers? And also people in the high energy physics I interested also in looking at, at Spark and other tools to parallelize uh, their uh, the Python analysis. So I, I went to uh, do some, uh, some, some small notebooks that I will show today and also wrote a blog post on what works and what doesn't. So we'll cover quickly today, so we'll just skim through it. So it will be a few slides to so we'll introduce some of the key points about Spark. And also I will, uh, I will mention um, what works and what doesn't work. Okay, you know, things that don't work very well with the sharing of us one. Okay, right. um, Just do something. Sorry about that. So one of the key selling points about Spark is the adoption in the industry. So this is, is a tool that is very much used. So you probably interested also because you, most of you have heard about Spark in if, even if you have not used it. So who is using it? So Databricks is a company um, founded by the people who started Spark and are still the top contributors. And it's, it's a key part of their business to sell an optimized uh, Spark uh, platform, but they also contribute to open source. Also, all cloud vendors offer some uh, big data um, tools, and they include uh, Spark. And many of the tech giants actually internally they use Spark, so this emerges from a mailing list and also contributions that they do to the Apache Spark project. For example, they hire Apache Spark PMCs, and so this is very very active and financed by um, so senior software engineers at these companies. At CERN, uh, we're using Spark um, mostly in the Hadoop platform. Uh, there are various use cases, IT monitoring, IT securities. Then we have a project with the um, experiments computing data. For example, I've been involved with the Arusha project and they do some reporting um, by using Spark. And then uh, for physics has been used by different projects. Uh, uh, you'll be familiar with uh, our data frame. And then there's also project CMS Spark. CMS, uh, Muon, POG, and there are various others. We also provide Spark on Kubernetes clusters, and people can access Spark uh, via notebooks using the, this one service. Various communities use uh, different uh, languages. Python, of course, is very popular. Other people use uh, Scala or Java. And then in the SLRA com community, there is a, a very large project. Um, on the petabyte scale that is using both Hadoop and Spark. And Spark is the main API. So actually they have based on API based on Spark where the users can analyze this uh, very important data from the accelerator complex. Okay, let's first start um, with a demo to answer the question. So can Spark do uh, some physics analysis? Let's see. So I have um, all the code is in a GitHub repo. Maybe the link is on the slides and uh, you can see it also here. And there are different um, type of notebooks that are, that are built and they are detailed in the readme. So the data is also available. It comes from this, uh, the open data. 
I typically transform it from root to parquet. We'll come back to that, but uh, we could also uh, redirect the root files from, uh, from Spark. So I'll start with this very simple uh, demo of the Dimeo max, max spectrum taken from a nice uh, demo for, um, from the root team. So I just basically translated it using the Spark APIs. You might be familiar about this. So the first thing to do is to download the data. I've already done this, and it takes uh, about a minute. And then there is a special package who we'll come to that to do histograms. I already installed it. And then the next thing is to actually install Spark. Uh, you can simply pip install PySpark, or you can download it. Since I use various versions, I typically download them and then specify the version that I want to use. Otherwise, with pip install, you guys just get the latest. Okay. All right, let's create the Spark session. Um, yeah, I'm just using a local uh, PC for this demo. I could be using uh, Swan or other, other services. There is a version of this demo that runs on Colab, for example, if you want to run it there without having any additional um, computing resources. So what I've done, I have created a Spark session. This initializes Spark and, and the various memory areas. Then I went to read the Parquet file, or at least I defined a data frame that would read from a Parquet file. That this, this is the file that I downloaded in a previous step. And then I just run a simple operation. Um, first, give me the schema of this data and then how many events are there. So the schema is a, and then OED type of schema, quite, quite simple and flat. So we have uh, how many muons are in a certain event, and then muon PT, eta, phi, gen chart, mass and charge. And there are about 6 million events in this, um, this file. First thing, we want to do a filter. So we want to have only two muons of opposite charge. And as you can see, this is, can be expressed in, bit in a Spark uh, data frame API in a quite intuitive way. And then uh, we computed the mu uh, mass We're using the simplified formula. This is a, as a sql uh, way of, of doing it. There are, of course, other ways of applying functions that look more like, uh, uh, for example, pandas and data frame. But as you can see, uh, it's quite clear what, what uh, the computation does. And then uh, um, data for, um, histogram computation, since we want the output of this will be an histogram. Um, th this is done using a Spark data frame API, but it's a bit of a boilerplate. It's actually at the end of the data frame. So what I've done, I, I put together the uh, three, four steps that are needed into a small uh, package and pushed it to PyPy. So I just have to specify minimum, maximum value, a number of bins. These are very simple frequency histograms, 1D histograms. Okay, and, so, and uh, I, um, I define a, a new data frame it is a transformation of the previous data frame with filter and, and mass calculation. And actually everything is very fast so far because we have only done data frame operations that are lazily as it executed. Now we tell uh, Spark to actually give us the data. So, and we are, we are putting it into um, Pandas data frame locally to this machine. And so the computation is triggered. The computation could be many steps. In our case, it's about three steps. It could be many more, and Spark puts everything together and optimizes it. So this runs in about 12 seconds. So now data is local in a Pandas data frame, so we can have a look at it. We can use a little bit of a matplotlib syntax to get the nice uh, plot of the uh, various um, particles and uh, resonances that this data set contains. OK, and we can also we finish, we can stop Spark. And this is the boilerplate code um, that does the histograms, but it's, it's a little bit out, uh, outside the scope of this talk. Okay, so I think we, we answer the question, can, can Spark run some basic physics analysis? Um, and let's see what else we can do. Okay, so the main abstractions that we use are data frame. Data frame should be quite familiar to you from from other environments, if you haven't seen Spark yet, it's basically a table-like abstraction, very similar to Pandas uh, data frames. It may, um, very important is that data must have a schema, and this is a very good thing about um, energy physics data. 
this typically has a schema. And then <clears> internally, <throat> Spark will parallelize the data and will also the data frames will be mutable, which allow uh, parallel execution tolerance and fault tolerance at scale. We come back to the point of uh, performing at scale, which is obviously very important. Okay. Another thing that we have seen in the notebooks, uh, uh, the data frame operations can be done. These are simple operations. A filter is just, just dot filter and now we specify the filter and then expressions and formulas, also complex one with uh, square roots. Also here we are using arrays. Um, as you can see, we index them, it can be done uh, and expressed easily with any Spark uh, API. And histograms are already commented about this package that collects uh, the various um, steps that need to be done. So I, I chose to generate histograms with the uh, Spark Data Frame API. So when we run this at scale, uh, Spark will be able to parallelize it. There are also other solutions like histogrammer, for example. So how, how does uh, Spark run jobs at scale? So there will be a driver uh, with the Spark session and the user code, which, com uh, which is communicating to a cluster manager which could be a young cluster manager or Kubernetes or a standalone cluster where executors will be spawned and then Spark uh, will run um, will run there in parallel. Typically data will be parallelized, uh, chunks of data, so partitions will be, um, will be uh, executed, will be computed on by the different executors and then the results will come back to the driver. Another important point about Spark is the um, ecosystem that Spark has. And uh, so we have seen there is a core engine. Here we are talking mostly about the data frame API with a little bit of Spark SQL, which is almost the same for, um, for Spark. There are also other APIs. Spark can talk uh, different languages, SQL, Python, and then Scala, Java, and R. A very important point is that Spark can ingest different data formats. It can ingest root, or Parquet or, or CSV, for example, both in reading and writing. It can be interfaced with many storage systems like Hadoop, EOS, S3, and then other uh, like RDBMS and streaming data, which are outside the scope of this. And then where to run Spark. So basically here I've been running it, the, the demo number one on a desktop machine, but then uh, Spark can run at scale on Hadoop, on Kubernetes, or on a standalone cluster, which can be created, for example, if you want to use have resources, uh, one can create it there. At CERN, we have, um, we have in production various clusters. It's mostly Hadoop, but also cloud containers that run Spark. In total, about uh, 5,000 cores and uh, several tens of petabytes of storage. And then one can also use of, uh, Spark on cloud containers on EOS and S3. Another, um, Another uh, interesting point that I quickly mentioned earlier and I want to further um, drill down on is that you can run Spark on our um, uh, this one service. This is basically Jupyter Notebooks that you can access uh, via web interface. Probably several of you have already tried them. Otherwise, uh, you can, this is the link. And this one is integrated uh, with the Spark uh, cluster as CERN. So that's one can can use that both the um, Hadoop clusters and the cloud containers clusters. And it's possible to access HFS, of course, but US and S3 as well. Okay, now just since we are talking about um, Spark at, uh, at scale, I wanted to show you uh, a quick uh, way on uh, the, the same uh, demo that I've shown before can also be run at scale, so we will not uh, be running it at scale, but I'll just show you because it's basically, it's the same, it's exactly the same thing that we have seen. But instead of allocating a Spark session locally, I can allocate it on a YARN cluster, for example, or on a Kubernetes cluster, the syntax will be different for Kubernetes. There are additional parameters about the number of executors and, and, and the memory that I want to run. The rest of the code stays the same. And in this example that you find in the GitHub, so I'm reading data, uh, which is available on the Analytics Hadoop cluster. 
This is a larger uh, version of the data, actually it's 100 times uh, bigger. This is 6.5 billion events. And in this demo that I ran, so you get the same graph because of the data is just simply copied for demo purposes and in about 30 seconds, and it executes this going in parallel on uh, 20 executors with 10 cores each. Okay. Then another important point for high energy physics is to handle complex schemas, because this is uh, what, uh, what is there typically for data. Um, so we've seen in the demo, actually the demo was a little bit flatter schema, but one can have really deep, uh, deeply nested schemas. The more nested, uh, yeah, the more you pay in performance, but uh, Spark can definitely handle it. And then there are, there are various ways um, to, to manipulate um, uh, arrays, so data that is nested. So there are various array functions in Spark, and then also explode function that transforms uh, array data into rows, and then one can use table functions. There are also some higher order functions where can, one can inject map and filter and aggregate operations on the array elements. And finally, the, the final solutions, if, if nothing else works, is our user you define functions. One can write them in Python or in uh, Scala, but then one can write the UDF in Scala and access it from Python, for example. One can also mix the languages. So I will go now to demo number three, um, where I took some of the, um, the task in the HEP analysis benchmark. The link is here, and that's a very nice benchmark that gives some, some target um, to, the, to this evaluation. And so I, I did some of the tasks there. Okay, a benchmark. This one, uh, similarly to the previous one, has also a callout version that you can run in callout. Since the, the data amounts are quite small, it, it runs there as well. And again, one needs to install Spark if you don't, don't have it yet. And uh, Spark histogram, get the data. Okay. So you the data. All right, so first thing is to do, get the Spark session. And we are still we are back to using local. Spark histogram with the boilerplate code for these simple 1D histograms using the data frame API. Okay, here uh, in this data set that comes from the uh, app benchmark, we have many more fields quite a lot of them and about 6 million uh, events. Yeah, yeah, single mute samples. That's the name of the file. The first uh, benchmark task is, is a very simple one. Basically, it's just an histogram of the uh, missing transverse energy of the events. So we just feed it to the histogram creation, transform it into pandas and matplotlib, matplotlib on the um, pandas in the local machine. Task Q2, it's also quite simple. Here you can see, um, these are the jet PT, the transverse momentum of the jets. So you can see there are arrays of different sizes because I mean, these are the first five rows. And then for this one, I chose um, the solution of just putting everything flat into a table, even the how easy this task is, and then just scrape an Instagram after that. And then you get the distribution. Then this is uh, plotting on transverse momentum of jets with eta, the absolute value of eta less than one. So I think the, this task also make it quite interesting as a, as a tutorial for somebody, for example, who is not in app and wants to see a little bit what what are the, some of the basic blocks of a, of a app analysis can be. So let's say some data scientist or the data engineer 
who is more familiar with Spark than, uh, than anything else, can have a look at this. They have a, an increasing complexity and can show some of the operations. And finally, we typically end up with, with a histogram. And then the complexity is going up. Let's see how we're doing with time. Okay, maybe we just do this one, the transverse momentum of events, uh, at least two jets. So here we have more, more constraints. So we want to have the um, missing energy the PT and then the jet PT. So we just take those. And here we start having some functions that, that do cardinality and then they push a filter inside an array. Uh, these are some of these high order functions that I mentioned. It becomes a little bit fancy, but still feasible with, with Spark functions. Then when it gets more complicated in, uh, in further tasks, we will not get there. We, will, we do need uh, UDLs to, to operate on that. Okay, I think you get a, a gist of it. It's probably hard to do uh, much more. I wanted to show you just another set of things that I've done. I took the Atlas X open data uh, demo again, and there are different complexity here. For, for example, in, in one of these notebooks, I recreate the figure two of the X paper, but I will just go for the simplest one. This just takes the, uh, it's quite a small amount of data from the um, open data. Yeah, so here we still have the previous Spark, so that's right. We are running two Spark sessions on this machine now. So as you see, a very small number of events for this. But then one can, uh, can have uh, filters like events with four leptons and then selecting two pairs of isolated leptons, which comprise of two leptons, the same flavor. So become a little bit uh, interesting. And then the flavor of the leptons needs to be filtered. These are things that can be expressed quite well with the data frame API. Then also, um, Spark doesn't have a concept of four vectors. So the, I'm afraid these are calculations need to be explicitly uh, made. Okay, I can uh, implement all the formulas that are needed and then there again, this goes into a histogram. And we get, for example, we see the Z boson and the X boson map mass. Okay, this just gives you a flavor of what is possible, the very basic analysis, or at least, um, let's say, components of analysis. And now we want uh, to wrap up. So the, the good parts, so the Spark Data Frame API is a powerful abstraction and a rich language. It, can allow, it allows to do data preparation and analysis. It's mature and as an industry reference and can handle a complex schemas, which is a must for high energy physics. So one can run data frame locally or scale. So for performance, one can take advantages of clusters, Kubernetes, so for cloud or Hadoop. So probably, uh, cloud resources and standalone clusters, let's say on HPC, is what uh, can be of most interest for this community. And then there are integrations with a large ecosystem. Many file formats can be ingested, including root. Many storage systems can be used, including OS, HDFS, S3. And then let's see the things that uh, are a little bit missing. So where Spark has still has to, um, to climb up uh, a steep, uh, inclined to, to get up to par with, um, with other uh, analysis tools, the performance. So there are several areas where the improvements are needed. Uh, Python UDF, we haven't seen them in the examples, but okay, I can mention that they work. It's possible to write Python UDF, but they, uh, they typically don't perform uh, too well. And Scala UDFs, uh, so UDFs written in Scala, typically perform better. As I mentioned, it's also possible to mix the languages, write the UDF in Scala and call it from Python. And then there are Spark functions. There are also some performance improvements to be done. So these higher order functions you will see briefly one uh, need a little bit of boost in performance, even though they, they already work reasonably well. 
And there is no knowledge of Lorentz vector at the moment. This is something that maybe can be added to Spark. And in terms of the Spark engine, so it, it runs in the JVM, which is compiled, it's written in Scala and Java, and has to compete in such, so to speak, uh, with uh, C++ code that is used uh, currently in the, uh, in the mainstream analysis tools. And this is, uh, of course, it's, it's not the same speed. Um, People in, uh, in the Apache Spark community are already working on vectorized execution and, and uh, putting some, some parts of the Spark engine into C++, so maybe this can improve. In terms of data format, uh, root is the king in, in this domain. Uh, it can be ingested uh, into Spark thanks to the Lorraine library, uh, typically maintained by Andrew Melo. Um, but there are limited resources for that. While Apache Spark or also Apache ORC format uh, works much better with Spark because a lot of optimizations and many people are, are putting a lot of efforts into that. So that if data is in Spark, it is in Parquet format, it's much better for Spark analysis. And then flatter data is, is much better for Spark. So in this respect, nano, nano AODs work so much better than the previously deeply nested formats. Uh, many in, in the future, uh, I see so Spark is, is achieving a lot of improvements. I already mentioned people working on uh, C++ extensions. Also, the, the app community is doing amazing work and developing uh, Python frameworks. And these things together can um, can also help uh, the uh, development of uh, analysis with, with Spark. At the moment, as you've seen, it's just for basic things. Maybe in the future can do, uh, can do more performance and, and, uh, and more functionality. So I'll be very interested to hear if some, somebody is interested in trying out Spark, you can reach me and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Also, I would like to thank many people who helped uh, doing this work and uh, consulting and many are in this community. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Luca. Uh, so I think, yeah, let's check Slido if there is anything there. Yeah, there is a question for me. <laughs> How many resources are allocated for Spark specific computation? It's Aaron just, you know, to promote more to community what is available and. Uh... Yep. So, um, for example, I can show you. So, this one is, is integrated uh, with, um, with certain clusters. So, with the Hadoop clusters and the cloud containers. And these are the resources available. For example, in the Hadoop at the moment, uh, the main Hadoop cluster has 1,800 cores, 13 petabytes of storage, and this is shared, of course, in 13 uh, terabytes of memory. So what happens when um, a job uh, runs on Spark from, from Swan or from other clients uh, into, into Hadoop is that um, there is dynamic allocation of resources with, with the maximum. So typically, you get a few hundred cores but several users can come in into the cluster simultaneously. And then there are also cloud containers where there are about 200 cores. And then, and then of course, one can, can bring in resources from, from the cloud. And then will be, uh, for example, an experiment can bring specific resources and run an on Spark on that. But these are the ones that are offered, let's say from, a, from IT to generic communities. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you see the slide the link or I will just read for your questions. So what is AOD? Uh, well, it's, a, it's a data format, I guess. Yeah, yeah. CMS. Well. Else can, can give more, <laughs> even a more detailed uh, explanation about that. We mentioned a lot of LHG, LHG experiments. Normal seems huge, do you think? The Spark is being used outside LXC experiments. Yeah, Spark is being used, uh, for example, CERN is used. Uh, one of the main users is the uh, accelerator login infrastructure. So I share the same. It's used by many. And one, oh, this is one actually, I even like a better slide. So already in physics, uh, there are other people using it uh, besides the, the analysis and the for analysis is only uh, experimental. So the um, so in production, so IT monitoring. So when you see the uh, IT monitoring, so one of the pipelines goes into a dupe and then um, 
data is sunk there and it can be used for long-term uh, processing. IT security also has, has a, um, jobs running there for uh, the um, detection of uh, attacks into, into the networks. And, uh, and then the experiments computing data, for example, the Russia project. So this is use Atlas and also CMS. As he uh, is a file catalog and needs to do a large reports, so exports the data from the relational database into, into Hadoop and then runs uh, Spark jobs. And also the export is, is done using Spark. And then, of course, our data frame makes a use of Spark that is different than what I've, I've shown here, but also it's using through the same platforms. And then there is a project called CMS Spark. And, uh, and I think last year, CMS new POG was presented by App 2021. And then various people have different projects, uh, smaller projects, but they run it. And there is this very large project where an API based on top of Spark is um, runs on this NSCAS platform. This is uh, an accelerator logging complex where they log uh, basically the thousands of sensors from the various accelerators and, um, and subsystems. And then when people need to query that, uh, they, they will, for example, connect to Swan ask for the events that they need, and they will get a Spark data frame back. And then they do the processing in that. Thanks. There is one more question. I would propose to move it to Slack because we're already 10 minutes late and it's like also a nice way to continue discussion in case people have more questions. So thanks a lot, Luca. Yeah, it was very nice. You.